Hi, welcome to ANOVA Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Charles Murphy, and we're streaming live from the ANOVA Fairfax Medical Campus in Falls Church, Virginia. February is American Heart Month, and we've been doing a series of heart health-related topics with uh, physicians from the ANOVA Heart and Vascular Institute. Um, ANOVA Heart and Vascular Institute is a leader in treating heart, vascular, and cardiac diseases and provides services at all five ANOVA hospitals. Um, it, this includes a dedicated heart hospital on the campus of the ANOVA Fairfax Medical Center. There's also a large network of outpatient facilities, uh, which includes cardiologists, electrophysiologists, pulmonologists, and specialized surgeons. In addition, there are non-invasive heart and uh, vascular diagnostic imaging locations located uh, throughout Northern Virginia. Uh, today we're going to be talking about women's heart health and I'm very excited about that topic. Um, if you have questions, please remember them to post them in the comment section and we will try to answer those questions uh, during our presentation. Um, and please keep in mind that the information that we are presenting is for informational purposes only and is not meant to replace the information that you receive from your physician. Today, I'm going to be joined by two leaders in the field of women's heart health, and I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves, but Dr. Epps and Dr. Pinnell Sias are, are both with us today, so please introduce. All right. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And um, I'm Dr. Pinnell Sayas. I'm a cardiologist with Virginia Heart, a large private practice in Northern Virginia affiliated with INOVA. Um, I'm primarily outpatient focused, but about 30 to 40 percent of the time I'm here at Fairfax seeing inpatients and doing advanced imaging procedures. Um, my interests include women's heart health um, because it's a broad and fascinating scope that spans the whole woman's life ranging from pregnancy to menopause and breast cancer survivorship and atypical heart disease. Um, so I, I have a great interest in all of this. Um, I also um, have a strong interest in primary prevention, which means seeing patients who don't yet have heart disease but have risk factors and working with them to make a treatment plan and reduce their risk, so. Thank you. Um, Dr. Epps? I'm Dr. Kelly Epps. I am an interventional cardiologist here at Inova Heart and Vascular Institute. So I, um, I take care of patients um, with coronary artery disease and, and heart valve disease, and I do procedures in our cath lab here and in our OR. And then I'm also the medical director of our cardiovas women's cardiovascular health center here at Inova. So I spend a lot of time um, taking care of patients, um, women who have a particular interest in, um, in prevention and how do they prevent um, certain risk factors and prevent heart disease from developing, um, as well as women who have a specific interest in how heart disease um, impacts women and um, what are some of the female um, specific or female predominant types of cardiovascular disease. I'm struck by the uh, fact that you both mentioned prevention. Uh, which I think is great because I think, you know, that's an area of huge opportunity and obviously if we can prevent some of these things from occurring, then we, we get ahead of the game. Well, let's dive right in. Uh, Dr. Epps, can you um, tell us, are there differences between men and women when it comes to uh, cardiac disease and strokes? Right, so there, so there are, and I think this is a, a great time to have a talk about this. You mentioned prevention and really focusing on, on how do we um, educate women because we know that heart disease is the number one killer of women and 80% of it is preventable, preventable by, um, by knowing risk factors and managing risk factors. And so the risk factors for men and women are, are largely similar, um, although there are some differences um, in how important each risk factor is for men versus women. Um, it's important for women to know that some of the signs and symptoms of certain types of cardiovascular disease can be different um, in men and women so that women are uh, really recognize these symptoms early. Um, it's important for women to know that um, while typically we think of heart disease developing later in life in women, that women um, can develop heart disease across their lifespan and that there are certain times of their life, particularly pregnancy, um, in which there are certain forms of heart disease that we have to be uh, more concerned about, um, and that there are certain female-specific types of heart disease that develop. Women are more likely to have smaller vessel 
um, disease than um, men in terms of the blood flow to the heart, the coronary arteries. Um, and there's certain diseases like rheumatologic diseases that may put women at higher risk for heart disease earlier in life um, compared to men. Okay. And um, Dr. Pinnell Sias, maybe you could comment on the, the differences in terms of angina and heart attacks in terms of uh, the symptoms that women get versus men, because I think that's a very important topic right. for right. our audience. So um, chest pain is still the most common symptom in men and women, um, but it's often more dull or varying in location in women, it can be jaw or shoulder, sometimes back pain, and often it's not the most prominent symptom. They, you might feel profound fatigue or shortness of breath or nausea, um, and so these symptoms, women may both be underestimating their risk, but the symptoms are also vaguer. So it often leads to women presenting later in their course of their heart attack, which of course um, can translate into worse outcomes. And I think it's important to mention that for stroke as well. Um, so stroke is the number one killer of women. And, um, and we know that the signs of stroke, there's common signs that happen in men and women. So that's um, weakness, um, Weak, sudden weakness, that's confusion, that's sudden headache, that's um, numbness or weakness in an arm, a leg, or in a certain side of the face, difficulty speaking. Um, and any of those should raise alarm for men or women. But we know women, similar to heart attacks, women are more likely to have these subtle um, or atypical symptoms too. So they're more likely to have generalized weakness um, or agitation um, as they are presenting symptoms. And so they may delay, um, delay treatment or delay identification um, of their stroke. And so that's why we wanna make sure that we're really educating women about what some of those differences are for them because mm -hmm. time is, is critical. And in the area of stroke, I, I, interestingly, I saw where, you know, over the age of 85 that um, more common in women. And then, you know, we were discussing earlier that there's a peak actually in younger mm -hmm. women, too, in their 20s and right. such with strokes as well. Right. Um, so I think that that's an interesting fact as well. Um, maybe we could dive a little bit into um, the uh, testing, like stress testing and such, too, because I think that there's some differences there too in terms of the testing to right. identify right. coronary disease. Right, so um, in looking to evaluate symptoms in men and women, the, the same tests are available, of course, for everybody. And in most people uh, with a normal EKG and um, able, ability to exercise on the treadmill, the plain treadmill stress test is probably still the right first test of choice, um, but it has, a potentially lower accuracy in women. And so when we have a higher probability of heart disease, um, pairing it with imaging can be, make it a more accurate, sensitive test. And so what we would do is the, a treadmill stress test, but then paired with imaging, which could be an ultrasound or nuclear imaging where this radio tracer gets injected in an IV and then follows the blood flow and lights up the heart under the camera and areas that don't light up are not getting adequate blood flow. Um, the choice of test is important to consider, um, in part because we worry about radiation in the area of the chest given women's risk for breast cancer. So we, um, there is a tendency to favor when you're doing imaging, perhaps stress echocardiogram in women, though the, um, there are advances in our nuclear imaging with different tracers and different scanners, particularly PET scanners, uh, where the level of radiation is much lower. And so um, all of that is a very complex decision that um, depends a lot on the probability of disease and, and uh, is a discussion to have, obviously, with the person who's evaluating you. Um, and then the last um, newer technology that we have that um, I think will be used more and more is a coronary CT where we get to see the arteries. This is where there's a CAT scan with dye that reconstructs the coronary arteries and can show us plaque, can show us narrowing, and even address, assess the blood flow in the arteries. Um, it requires IV dye, it requires a slow heart rate for good image quality, um, but um, it can be a very definitive test. It's definitely only it's not appropriate for somebody who's low risk or has a high, prob a high probability of coronary disease, but is particularly good test for that intermediate range 
um, and uh, is very definitive. Okay. And then we've sort of all gotten all the way to interventional, so it makes me think, uh, Dr. Epps, maybe you should just ask right. if you want to add anything from an interventional standpoint regarding the difference between women mm -hmm. and men and maybe with um, related to uh, outcomes and sure, such. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm an interventional cardiologist, so I spend a lot of my time in the cardiac catheterization lab, and this is where we um, do invasive testing, so it's an angiogram. If someone has a positive stress test or an abnormal stress test, they may end up um, in the cardiac catheterization lab with me. Um, and what we know about women, so women who are, are having heart attacks, um, they are more likely than men to have something called small vessel um, coronary artery disease or microvascular disease so the um, so they're less likely to um, to be thought of in some ways as similar um, to men because they may undergo an angiogram and we see that there really are no major blockages in their arteries yet we know that they are still at high risk for having another type of heart event later in life but sometimes they're not recognized as having the same type of heart disease as men um, in the sense that they may not have a significant blockage requiring a stent or an intervention um, we also know that women, um, women tend to be um, at higher risk for bleeding with some of our um, procedures in the cardiac catheterization lab. So we think about different approaches um, and we think um, doing a cardiac catheterization through the radial artery, which is an artery in the arm, um, tends to have less risk of, of, of bleeding and, um, and this, may have, um, this may have benefits for women as well. Um, and knowing that the medications that we put patients on after they have a heart catheterization as well, if we do see plaque buildup, um, that women should be on many of the same guideline-directed therapies that men should be on, but sometimes they're uh, less likely to tolerate those medications um, and may have more side effects from medications like statin therapies. Are there any differences, uh, women versus men, in terms of events following uh getting a stent or any chance, any uh, differences in how often the uh, blockages return? Right. So we know that uh, men and women both have, have good outcomes from coronary, um, coronary stenting and that um, outcomes tend to be similar, but we know certain women, particularly women who are in minority groups, if we look at their outcomes one year after having a heart event, they're more likely to have a recurrence of some type of heart event in the year following um, compared to men and compared to um, white women. Okay, great. Now, you know, there, there are some very unique things about women and what I'm uh, thinking about is um, these life events such as pregnancy and menopause. So maybe um, you could um, talk about some of the things that occur with pregnancy related to heart health, uh, Dr. Pinnell Sias. Okay. Um, yeah, so in pregnancy, um, to support the uterus, you have this increase in blood flow, about 40% increase in blood flow from the heart. So um, that, causes to some degree normal shortness of breath and leg swelling that we can see in normal pregnancy, but there can, it can also be a strain on the heart. So women who have valve problems um, often will become more symptomatic in pregnancy, and those patients, when they're identified, have to be followed closely um, for that. There are also um, specific times in pregnancy where um, heart complications can develop. Um, there, it's important to monitor blood pressure and towards the end of pregnancy that can evolve into a syndrome called preeclampsia which when severe we know predicts heart disease down the road and can compromise the pregnancy. Um, there also are um, times where there's actually pregnancy induced heart failure this we term uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy and it will, it's rare in, in happening in fewer than one in a thousand live births, though more common in African American women um, and older women uh, and women with traditional risk factors like diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, but those women may present in the final months of pregnancy and most often postpartum, early postpartum with shortness of breath, leg swelling, and the key is not sort of blowing off your symptoms as normal in pregnancy, but coming in for evaluation, and if your symptoms are progressive, that evaluation should probably include an ultrasound of your heart and an evaluation by a cardiologist. So a couple things come to mind from that. One is I think it's underappreciated the long-term impact of having preeclampsia or eclampsia. Maybe 
Um, Dr. Epps, mm -hmm. you know, maybe mention that because I think, right. again, like you mentioned, th that can have long-term importance. Right. I, d I do. I think it's so important to recognize um, there are certain um, pregnancy-associated um, conditions that we know are associated with higher risk of heart disease um, in the future, and that could be 10, 15 years down the line, but it really is like a failed stress test when you have these events that happen during pregnancy. This is a signal. This should be a signal to the patient. It should be a signal to their health care providers that they are at high high risk. And the, many of these risk factors, such as preeclampsia, they go away at the time of delivery. And so um, a woman may not know that she continues to carry that risk with her. Someone who has severe preeclampsia, their risk of having a heart event is ninefold higher than someone um, of, with similar characteristics who did not have preeclampsia. Um, and that's, that's significant. The risk of having of, of diabetes increasing your risk of heart disease is twofold, of hypertension probably about twofold. So a ninefold increased risk is really significant. And this is something Thing, um, that we should really make sure that these women know about this, that they're really making sure that they um, live a heart healthy um, life and that the risk factors are well controlled so that down the line they don't, um, they don't develop heart disease. You know, but by the same, sorry, no that, um, but by the same virtue, it's actually, it's an opportunity, right, to identify people who are higher risk. So, um, so yes, it signals that risk, but we, we don't, we need to sort of be proactive um, going forward, and that can be a very positive thing, actually, to have identified those women who are at higher risk. Um, and even the, just the, in a normal pregnancy, women in their 20s and 30s often are, haven't seen a doctor regularly. Maybe a quarter of them have never had any prior health screening. More women are delaying having their children until their 30s and 40s, so they may have uh, a higher likelihood of having already developed diabetes or high blood pressure. And this is an opportunity where women are walking in the door, seeing a doctor and getting potentially diagnosed. So all of this is, a, again, an opportunity for early diagnosis, recognizing risk, and then making changes that down the road can prevent a heart attack and stroke. The other thing that leapt into my mind with your comments was that um, is these fairly rare situations where somebody gets post Heart, uh, heart failure, and you know we've actually had a couple of patients on um, ex extracorporeal life support right. uh, as a result, uh, and fortunately had good outcomes. But it may be one of the strengths of going to a place like Inova, where you actually right. have this full spectrum, including advanced heart failure, cardiac surgery, and again, fairly uncommon. But again, it you know there's a full range, and I think we'll see some other um, examples where. Um, some of the strengths of being in a, um, uh, having these capabilities may be important. Right. Um, I think, Dr. Epps, if we could, so pregnancy, another life event yes. in women is menopause, is menopause, and maybe you right. could talk about how that impacts uh, heart health. Absolutely. So, you know, menopause is a natural phase in the life of a woman, and it doesn't cause heart disease, but we do know that it's associated with increased risk of heart disease, that women tend to develop heart disease about 10 years later than men, and we're often seeing that um, when women are postmenopausal. Um, and part of, the, um, part of the reason is that risk factors um, tend to change um, during that time period. And so traditional risk factors for heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, physical inactivity, weight gain, we know those things can change with menopause. Women are more likely to have blood pressure elevation, blood pressure changes where we see rises um, with menopause. LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, tends to increase with menopause. HDL, the good cholesterol, tends to stay the same, or if not, it, it declines in menopause. And so all these changes can increase, um, increase your risk. So it's very important for women to know um, around that time to make sure that they are getting um, checkups and that they know their numbers. And even if their numbers had been normal, previously that these changes can be expected with this, um, with this life change and, um, and important for them to really, um, to really be aware of that. Okay, and then care carry on a little bit with that. Let's maybe just run through the common risk factors mm -hmm. for sure. heart disease sure. since you brought those up. Absolutely, so high blood pressure. Um, so hypertension, a diagnosis of hypertension is a blood pressure that's greater than 130 over 80, normal blood pressure being 120 over 80 or less. Um, 
that is a risk factor. High uh, cholesterol is a risk factor. So can, and mm -hmm. let me just yes. interrupt for a second, because yes. this sure. is one of our questions. It's what blood pressure numbers should be concerning to women. Right. So anything over 130, over 80 should be concerning right. at this point? So I would say that that is, that is a, um, a diagnosis of hypertension, and that should certainly, um, should certainly raise, um, raise attention and awareness. It doesn't mean that all those patients need to be on medications to treat it. Um, we think that pa patients who are in stage one, the early phases of hypertension, hypertension, that's 130 to 139, over 80 to 89, um, that they can be potentially managed first with lifestyle modification. So that's uh, heart healthy diet, exercise, low sodium um, in their diet, watching caffeine intake and alcohol because those things can reduce, excuse me, can increase blood pressure. Um, but, but that is 130 over 80 is the number that I would say women should start to pay attention to those numbers. Okay. And I'm sorry, I interrupted, but oh, that's maybe okay. keep going with the risk sure. factors. Sure. Other risk factors, mm -hmm. high cholesterol. Um, diabetes, and we know that diabetes is one of the risk factors, that's actually a stronger risk factor in women than men. So women with diabetes are more likely to have heart disease than men. Um, smoking is a risk factor as well, and we know same thing, smoking is more of a risk factor for women than for men. So please no, no tobacco, so right? No tobacco, no, no smoking. No, no smoking. Um, that physical inactivity, and, and there's some research that shows that women may be less active um, than men. Um, and then um, certainly obesity and over, overweight is an issue as well, and a, a risk factor for heart disease. And, and one other thing to mention is family history. I think that's very important. It's specifically important for women who are younger because we know that premature heart disease um, tends to be genetic. Um, and so there are women who we traditionally think of as low risk for heart disease. If they have that family history, they actually may be higher risk than their numbers may show. And Dr. Pinnell Sias, maybe you could sort of delve into some ethnic differences mm -hmm. in, in these things. So both African-American and Hispanic women tend to have more of these traditional risk factors. Um, African-American women have a much higher incidence of high blood pressure. So 40% of African-American women over age 20 have high blood pressure. And that high blood pressure tends to be earlier onset in life. It can be more severe and uncontrolled. Um, and it's probably associated with why African-American women are particularly at a higher risk for stroke. Um, there's also likely a more salt sensitive component to the high blood pressure, which we think has a genetic basis related to sodium retention so that um, African Americans are particularly salt sensitive and restricting salt in your diet um, can have a strong impact in lowering your blood pressure if you're African American. Um, they also have higher rates of diabetes and obesity. His, and they may not really have symptoms from being having high blood oh, pressure. Oh, yeah, so. high blood pressure doesn't hurt, unfortunately. So right. you really have to have measured your blood pressure and again, know your numbers because these are not, these are not, risk factors don't give you symptoms. They are just the backdrop that creates your risk. And starting early to control these things is important too, right? Mm -hmm. Because That's I mean, right. I remember these studies from the Korean War where they did autopsies and, and the young men that were in their 20s had early changes in their mm -hmm. blood vessels right. and mm -hmm. such. So you guys would say, Get, get on it early? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Good. We're, uni we're unified in recommending that. And then, sorry, you asked about oh. ethnicity. So the other uh, Hispanic women. So Hispanic women, um, on some statistics, suggest that they have onset of heart disease about 10 years before non Hispanic white women. Um, and they have more prevalent risk factors, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. Um, that said, overall Hispanic women have lower rates of coronary artery disease and are 25% less likely to die of their heart disease. So there is something protective as well that we, is not well understood. And I want to switch course here and jump into, in a time um, left, is into cardio-oncology, Dr. Mm -hmm. Epps, because mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some exciting work um, being done and um, good for our patients, um, but can you sort of dive into that broad topic of, of cancer and drugs and sure. radiation and sure. how that's a key topic? 
Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we're excited about here at Inova is that we really have partnered with our cancer center. So cardiology and oncology coming together um, with this, a new emerging field called cardio-oncology. We're really focusing on the cardiovascular um, health of cancer patients. And we know that um, many of the cancer treatments chemotherapy, radiation, which are, are life-saving for, for many women, we also know do have some harmful effects on the heart. And we're really focusing on how do we, um, how do, we do a cardiac assessment on new uh, breast cancer patients in particular is what we're work focusing on here at ANOVA right now, but focusing on having a cardiac risk assessment in those patients um, prior to starting cancer therapy. And those patients who we identify to be higher risk, either based on risk factors prior to starting cancer therapy or based on the cancer regimen that they're getting, um, will be referred to a cardiologist for a consult. And those, those women will have increased um, surveillance on the heart during their, um, during their chemotherapy um, and radiation therapy. And they also, um, there are some potentially cardioprotective medications that we can start in women that we are identifying as higher risk. Um, so I think it's important for optimal cancer outcomes. We're starting to realize that it's important to have um, ideal cardiovascular health to maintain that through cancer treatment and beyond cancer treatment. And I think what you said, it's very important that there are interventions that are available that can be cardioprotective or protect the heart. So, mm -hmm. you know, there is that's something that can be done um, to help. So that's, yes. that's obviously huge. And I, but I think that's another example of where um, having um, a full spectrum of these capabilities available in fairly specialized areas mm -hmm. uh, is so important. Yes. Um, let's talk about um, exciting um, new developments in the area of cardiac health uh, for women and stuff. Dr. Pinell Sias, do you wanna maybe, from your perspective, what are some exciting areas? Yeah. So I would say that probably the most exciting development uh, for me in the last couple of years is in the field of diabetes, right? Because you mentioned that diabetes is a much stronger risk factor for women. Um, they have, diabetic women have a risk of heart disease three to four times that of non-diabetic women and more risk than diabetic men. So it's especially relevant to women. And thankfully, there's a huge sea change in how we are thinking about and managing the risk of diabetes. Um, the, um, while it's still important to control your sugars, we're now more focused on addressing the risk of diabetes. And the FDA now mandates that new drugs show uh, some outcomes data in terms of heart events. And from that have come two large classes that show so much promise and are so exciting. So one is SGLT2 inhibitors with medicines like Jardians, Invacana, and Farxiga. These medicines um, in diabetics with additional traditional risk factors like high blood pressure or cholesterol reduce your risk of developing heart failure by 20%, which is huge uh, because there's a lot of heart failure that stems from diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, they also, those same medicines used in diabetics who have heart disease, reduce your risk of a heart attack and heart-related death by a similar um, sweep and in, in diabetics who have diabetic kidney disease, it protects them from progressing to needing dialysis or having worsening renal failure. So these are huge important outcomes in a huge population at risk. Um, and the second exciting drug class uh, is GLP-1 receptor agonists and these are meds like Victoza and Ozempic. And those particularly in patients with known heart disease have been shown to reduce all-cause death and, and heart-related death. So again, just a shift in how we think about diabetes. So it's not just important to control your sugar to get the numbers down, but to make sure you're on the right regimen that might protect you from the important um, downstream complications of diabetes. Okay. Um, Dr. Epps, um, exciting new Exciting things. Yeah. So I, so I, so I'm an interventional cardiologist. So I worry about plaque buildup a lot in the um, in the heart. And so I would say for me, when I think particularly for women, um, an exciting advance has been um, the development of a category of drugs called PCSK9 inhibitors. Those are medications that can significantly reduce your LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, um, and they can be added to statins. Those are medications that we use to lower um, lower bad cholesterol. 
or in patients who can't tolerate statins, they're really good medications. And we know that women are more likely to have um, what we call muscle-related or muscle-associated symptoms with their statins, so they're less likely to tolerate the medications. Um, we know that women are less likely to be prescribed statins, and they're also less likely to continue statin therapy once they are prescribed. Um, and this is a very important um, part of preventing heart diseases to reduce that, uh, that bad cholesterol. So I think PCSK9 inhibitors, that would be um, one thing that I think is very exciting because um, they, women are, uh, who can't tolerate statins would now be able to tolerate this medication. And really push those bad cholesterol levels down to low levels. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I think, Dr. Pinnell Sias, you also mentioned maybe atrial fibrillation and some of the new right. therapies. Right, right, right. Okay, so um, atrial fibrillation for everyone at home is an irregular heartbeat um, which has a risk of forming clot in the heart, which if it goes to your brain can cause a stroke. Um, so women in particular at higher risk and especially with age. So a woman above age 65 has a higher risk and still more if above age 75. And 10 years ago, the only medication we had for this is warfarin or Coumadin, which um, famously is hard to regulate, um, have to monitor blood work and has to be kept in a narrow range or it puts you at an excessive bleeding risk or doesn't work. So. 10 years ago, fewer than half of the patients who should, should have been recommended blood thinning were on it. Um, and in the last 10 years, we've had four new drugs come forward, um, medicines like Eliquis and Pradaxa and Xarelto and uh, Cerveza. These are um, oral drugs that don't, requ- don't interact, uh, don't have significant drug interactions, don't require blood work, and in every case are either equivalent in stroke prevention or better than the old warfarin, um, and with far less bleeding risk, particularly of the scary bleeds in the brain that we most fear. Um, so I think we're doing so much better at addressing uh, stroke risk in AFib, um, and the numbers bear that out. I, I looked for data, I think there was something between 2008 and 2014, the number of people on anticoagulation had gone from somewhere around 50 to 61 percent and I imagine based on my experience that that's much higher now because these are much more widely prescribed and very well tolerated medicines. And it's so nice from a lifestyle thing not to have to be going to oh, yeah. have your labs mm-hmm. checked every or so often. And not enjoy tour. your spinach and right, oh. the, <laughs> the diet things that we have to restrict, right? Right, yeah. exactly. Okay, um, we actually have a couple more questions that I think we could delve into. So one of our listeners um, comments that they're having chest pressure and they want to know if they need to be worried about that. So maybe you could just, so we have somebody sure. and um, just talk about chest pressure and whether they need to be seen or right, not. Right, right. So Dr. I think, Epps. absolutely. I think any time you're having mm-hmm. symptoms in the chest, you should be evaluated um, by, your, by your doctor. Um, the things that we are, get the most concerned about are, are things like heart attacks or blockages in heart arteries. Um, and, and we want to make sure that um, patients get the appropriate workup for that. I think a lot of times women sometimes attribute their symptoms to other things. And chest pain can be other things. But, uh, but I think it's very important to make sure that the heart is assessed if you're having those types of symptoms um, and to, to make sure that, um, that things look okay. And maybe if it sounds like it's been going on for a while, so addressing it with their primary care provider um, would be reasonable. Be or, uh, and then obviously Good. if it was a more urgent situation, is, is then they would go to some sort of more urgent um, evaluation. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, a very interesting question. I experienced uh, Takasubo syndrome approximately five years ago. Uh, am I at risk for a second happening? Um, Dr. Pinnell Sias, yeah. I'll throw that one at right. you. So you mentioned sort of the microvascular dysfunction that, that underlies a lot of this atypical heart disease that women can have. And we think that that's probably what underlies Takasubo syndrome to some extent. Takasubo syndrome, for those at home who aren't uh, familiar with it because it's a rare syndrome, is also um, called broken heart syndrome. It's often a stress-induced response where you have a sudden, um, can have sudden chest pain and present like an acute heart attack, but don't have any abnormality of your large arteries and have just a ballooning of the heart and loss of heart function that's very acute. Those patients recover well. The majority recover very well. 
and there is definitely a higher risk of recurrence. Um, I, I don't want to quote a number because I don't recall offhand, but it, there is a risk of recurrence, and it's thought to be because of this baseline coronary microvascular dysfunction that's underlying it. Great, thank you. A little advanced placement one there. I think what we're going to figu uh, finish off with is uh, top five ways women can improve their heart health, and David Letterman has his top 10 list. We're going to do top five, and I think we'll go back and forth, okay. and then I'll give you a chance to add something in if we miss something with our top five list. So, sure. hmm. But number five, Dr. Epps. Oh, oh we're going, oh, we're going, fun. I, okay, so we won't rank them, I think. They're oh, all, yeah, they're yeah, all yeah, important. Yeah. They're uh, all exactly. important. There you go. Well. We won't rank them exactly that way, but we'll come up with five. Okay, so. five. I think, um, uh, to me, first one is know your numbers. So I think very important. We mentioned how important blood pressure is um, and how blood pressure can change over lifespan. So know your numbers. Know what your blood pressure is. Know what your cholesterol is. Know what your blood sugar is. Okay, so this is women can improve their heart health. Dr. Pinel Sias? Don't smoke. And if you smoke talk to your doctor about quitting and coming up with a plan. All right, Dr. Epps? Regular exercise. So, so important. Um, the American Heart Association recommends at least 150 minutes per week. That's 30 minutes for five days a week um, at a minimum. And that's what we think will maintain good cardiovascular health. Um, next. Um, so we touched on family history. It's really important to know if you're at a heightened risk with family history. and. I also want to define that for people at home because it's not your grandparents in their 80s had a heart attack. It's generally we want you to look at your siblings, your parents, one degree from you, and men who've had heart disease before age 55 and women before age 65. That is the group that really is at a higher risk because of that family history. Dr. Next, Epps? Maintain a, maintain a healthy weight. Um, so we know that um, overweight and obesity drives so many of these other risk factors that we've talked about. Drives blood pressure higher, um, patients can have um, higher uh, cholesterol and more likely to have uh, issues with their blood sugar, which can lead to diabetes. Um, and so maintaining a healthy weight um, is very important. And I'll include diet on that one. We'll yes. The weight and the diet, diet kind of thing we'll include in there. And then I'm going to give you a, a chance to add anything that you want to add. So I was going to do diet, so you okay. stole that. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, all right. And Dr. Epps, what, anything else that uh, they should do? I think that sound, that's a good start. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Start. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> all right. Um, great. Well, what I wanted to do next uh, was just thank our, um, our viewers uh, for watching our Facebook Live. And then I would also um, like to uh, remind people that if you have uh, any further questions, um, you can uh, actually go to our website, which is anovaheart.org. Um, and we actually have a free heart risk assessment um, at that site if you're interested. If you need assistance in locating a heart specialist, you can go to anovaheart.org forward slash specialists or you can call our physician referral service at 1-855-MAYANOVA, which is 694-6682. I certainly thank Dr. Pinnell Sias and Dr. Epps for joining us today. I think this was a great discussion and we certainly appreciate their expertise in this area. And we look forward to seeing our uh, audience at our next Facebook Live session. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Chuck. Thank you.